Today, actually, we're going to look at verses 8 through the end of the letter uh, in verse 25. Let's start by committing our time to the Lord. Lord, thank you for your grace uh, of a new day. Thank you that your mercies are new today. And Lord, we just give this time to you. I pray you would speak through me and speak through your word, this material, this letter to Philemon. Pray that you would bring its truth to life in our hearts today. I pray for Pastor Frank next hour that you would speak through him. In Christ's name, amen. Well, as we just a quick bit of recap from last week, Philemon is the shortest of Paul's letters that we have uh, in the New Testament. It's right before Hebrews in your Bible. It's on one page, might be on two, depending on how your page breaks are. Last week's I said that we could call our study a few different options. We could call it a, uh, a note to a fellow worker, if we were titling uh, our message here, or a lesson on forgiveness. We could call it that. Hey, can I ask a favor? We could call it that. And all of those would be correct uh, in you know, one degree or another. Uh, I also mentioned that in Philemon we get a bit of a snapshot of what Paul wrote about kind of in theory, uh, if you will, in his other letters. In Philemon he brings those great theological themes uh, in his other letters uh, elsewhere. It shows them here in practical application. So let's see what uh, it's all about. Let's read the letter to Philemon. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I've derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he's wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I will be graciously given to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now, just to catch up a bit, Paul's writing from Rome, where he is under house arrest. We saw that in Acts uh, chapter 28, 16. Uh, when we came to Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. And then down at the bottom, verse 30, 31, Paul lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all, without boldness and, or with, with all boldness and without hindrance. Commentators mostly agree that he also wrote Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians uh, during this period, and the four letters are often called the prison epistles. Now, Colossae itself is a smallish city about 100 miles east of Ephesus, which is on the coast of what we now know as Turkey. Church of Colossae was started during Paul's three-year ministry in Ephesus during the third missionary journey. 
a Colossian resident named Epaphras, probably came to faith while he was uh, in Ephesus on business maybe, then went home, eventually started the church at Colossae, though we don't have any evidence that Paul actually went there uh, himself. Our letter to Philemon was written about six years later. So Paul wrote it, Philemon received it, and the object of it is Onesimus. Now he was one of Philemon's probably several or perhaps many slaves. Uh, and the slaves, probably more like domestic servants, maybe than what we would think about in the pre-Civil War US. Uh, Philemon himself, he was a wealthy citizen. The church at Colossae met uh, in his house. Onesimus had run off at some point, probably took some of uh, Philemon's stuff with him, and eventually he got to Rome. In God's providence there, he encountered Paul at some point and responded to the gospel. We also talked a bit last week about themes of the letter, three main themes. First one being reconciliation, um, which is brought about in and through the work of Christ, the message of how God in his mercy reconciles individuals uh, to himself. Secondly, uh, the unifying principle of how faith in Jesus transforms the relationships between different types and classes uh, of people. And then the third one, and the primary one, is forgiveness. Remember last week uh, I noted that John MacArthur said, of all the human qualities that make men in any sense like God, none is more divine than forgiveness. And one more thing about the letter before we dig into the, the text itself is the purpose. Now theme and purpose are of course related and similar. Um, commentators have suggested a variety of purposes uh, that Paul had in writing this little letter. The first one is to demonstrate the nature of Christian love. And of course we see that here. Secondly is to reveal the working of God's providence. That's also here. Third one, to demonstrate Christian courtesy. We just read the letter, there aren't any commands in it, it's all based on love. Appealing to Philemon on the basis of love. Uh, a fourth principle is maintenance of good Christian relations. And we, of course we see that here. Another one is to reveal the effect of conversion on culture and society. And we'll camp on this one just uh, for a few minutes. There's a popular approach uh, today among commentators is that the letter to Philemon is Paul's attack on the institution of slavery. And the purpose of the letter is to argue for abolishing it. To be sure, principles exhibited in Paul's request speak clearly and directly to abuses in master and slave relationships. But nowhere in scripture is any effort ever made to abolish slavery. No New Testament proffer, prophet, preacher, teacher, or apostle ever atta attacks the institution itself. However, and this is key, this is key, the call to righteous living and holy love will eliminate the abuses between people, all people, regardless of class and status, including masters and slaves. Look at Ephesians 6, 5 through 9. Bond servants, obey your early ma earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart as you would Christ not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he was a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them. Stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Colossians 4.1. Masters, treat your bond servants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And 1 Timothy 6, verse 1 and 2, let all who are under a yoke as bond servants regard their own masters as worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their good service are believers and beloved. And again, 1 Peter 2.18, servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Paul and Peter here are telling slaves, be obedient, submissive, loyal, faithful to their masters, no matter how they act. Masters are told to treat their slaves with love, equity, kindness, and fairness, no matter what their slaves might do. So rather than attack slavery as an institution, as a business model, as a way of life in that society, the New Testament authors are using slavery as an illustration, 
as a model of Christian principle. Slavery becomes a picture, uh, as it were, of how we are related to God and his servants. In fact, slavery was so much a part of the Roman Empire, whole society was built on it. As many as one-third of the population of the cities of the Roman Empire uh, were enslaved. Yet it's important to know slavery wasn't necessarily what we think it is today. Again, I mentioned this earlier. They were more like domestic servants, many of them. And of course, from our vantage point, slavery is among the most vile effects of the fall. And it's critical to note, and I put a star in my notes next to this, critical to note, New Testament authors were not defending slavery at all. Like pre-Civil War Christians in the South tried to twist it that way. No, the early church just wasn't as concerned with the social ills or economic systems as they were the spiritual condition of their fellow citizens. Imagine if Jesus and the apostles had attacked slavery head on. What might have happened in the Roman Empire? 60 million slaves revolting. What do we know about the Roman Empire and how they just love dissension in the ranks? Can you imagine 60 million slaves uh, rising up? Chaos, disarray, anarchy, right? The slaves would have been crushed, brutally massacred. What about those who encouraged it, fomented it? What do you think would have happened? Now, so Paul's message is, is not only not attacking the institution of slavery, it's actually doing the opposite. It's telling a slave, go back to your master. Be the kind of slave that he ought to be, as if all masters were loving and caring, even if they weren't. And the British commentary, I'll, I'll end with this here, the uh, James D.G. Dunn, I really liked how he wrote this. As far as Paul's attitude towards slavery in general and its relevance to today is concerned, we simply need to remind ourselves that one, in the ancient world, slavery was accepted as an integral part of society and its economic working. Two, while treatment of slaves was recognized as a moral question, the fact of slavery was not. It was only the revulsion against the slave trade in modern period in Europe and North America which made slavery itself morally repulsive. And three, that in the absence of modern democracy, it would not have been possible to conceive of an effective political protest against slavery, slave rebellions having consistently failed. And four, the most effective progress of the slave's lot had to depend on the master's kindly treatment of the slave. And also remember, the Jewish leaders of the day, they were looking for a political messiah, right? Not a spiritual one. Attacking the institution of slavery it would have been a political move, right? That's not why Jesus came. Jesus came to take on himself the full punishment that we deserve for our sins as a substitute in our place so that our sins could be forgiven. And that brings us back to the central theme uh, here in Philemon of forgiveness. Forgiveness is the message. Forgiveness uh, is the intent. So now let's look at the text again. We'll start in verse 7 where we left off last week. I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you, I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. Now, Paul has already set the tone with greeting, thanksgiving, and prayer. And in verses 1 to 7, Paul is effectively reestablishing his relationship uh, with Philemon. Remember, there weren't any phones then, there weren't any texting. You didn't dial a number on the phone and, hey, how you doing? I'm sure miss you, thinking about you. You know, there wasn't any of that. It also wasn't a postal system. It wasn't write a letter, stick a stamp on it, drop it in the box and trust it's going to get there. You know, there wasn't any of that. Now, there was a courier system, of course, and there were the Roman road network, you know, allowed for travel and transportation, and you could drop correspondence off with somebody and it hopefully would get there eventually. But just nothing like we have today. So... First seven verses, Paul's reestablishing you know, this link between these two dear friends. Look at verse 8. Accordingly, therefore, for this reason, depending on the translation, for what reason? I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. The reason? It's the relationship. It's the relationship. Paul's appeal is 100% based on this. 
and on the mutual indebtedness of just being a member of the commu Christian community, which we'll see uh, here in a bit. Well, continuing in verse 8, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required. What Paul's saying here is he has every right, every spiritual authority to talk to Philemon man to man. Hey, bud, here's the deal. An interesting nuance here is that that bold enough in Christ. Think about that for a second. Paul, he's in prison, house arrest, no freedom, or very, very little. The writer of the letter, prisoner. The recipient, Philemon, wealthy citizen, probably quite prominent. The contrast between the prisoner ordering the prominent citizen would probably not have been lost uh, on Philemon. But that in Christ peace gave Paul the confidence that he would not at all be out of line by telling Philemon that he needed to do, you know, what was coming. But that in Christ not only put the two men on equal footing, it transcended those differing social statuses that the two had. So Calvin, in his commentary, described Paul's words this way. Though I have authority so that I might justly command you, your love makes me prefer to entreat or appeal to you. Now here's another nuance. Paul could have just skipped eight and nine, gone right to 10. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. But Paul doesn't. And here's why eight and nine uh, are so important. Philemon, wealthy, likely prominent citizen of Colossae. You would think that he would understand his duty as a citizen of Rome to uphold the laws of the state, right? Orderly society. In this case, he could be expected to deal with the runaway slave in such a way that would say, you don't want to do that, slaves. Not going to tolerate that kind of behavior. Instead, by letting Philemon know that he, Paul, had the authority in Christ to order him to do that, but he wasn't, the implication is that Philemon's duty was yes to the law, but more than that, by being transformed by Christ, Philemon's duty is now higher than that of the law of the land. Of course, by law, Philemon possibly could have had Onesimus executed. He had committed a crime, felony, as it were, uh, in that culture, and had split, got to Rome, tried to hide. But Paul is appealing to Philemon on grounds higher than upholding the law and a case that directly affected him. Verse 9, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus. Now, by preceding uh, his appeal with that declaration of his rights, Paul is emphasizing the motivation uh, that he wants Philemon to consider. Love, Paul's love for him, his love for Paul. Paul's reminder that Philemon is known by others for what? For his love. Now, we might think that by saying an old man and now a prisoner, Paul's being emotionally manipulative, heartstring blackmail, right? But actually, in that time and culture, appeal to emotions was standard practice in Greek rhetoric. Plus, he also knew Philemon personally. He knew how far he could push and be out of line. He also knew what would have been too little to have any meaning at all. I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, verse 10, whose father I became in my imprisonment. <clears throat> so here we are, 10 verses in, more than a third of the letter before Paul gets to the point, as it were, the, the subject, the object. This is the first time Onesimus is mentioned. He follows right away with whose father I became. My child Onesimus, whose father I became. New American Standard, NIV, and others translate it, my son Onesimus. Paul isn't giving Philemon the opportunity to separate the former slave from the now saved slave. And Paul uses this language throughout his letters to describe people who were converted you know, through his ministry. 1 Corinthians 4.14, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. A couple verses later in 4.17, this is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ. 1 Timothy 1.2, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. And Titus 1.4, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. And there are lots of others. Verse 11, 
Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful, both to you and to me. <coughs> now here Paul is, uh, he's found some humor into the mix here, a pun, right? The name Onesimus means useful. It was a fairly common name for slaves, actually, uh, at the time. Useful was useless, but now he's useful, is basically what he's saying. It's like if I said, I was talking to Frank, and he was being frank with me. We were having a frank discussion. That's, that's the idea uh, here, right? Uh, of course, it's easy to imagine Onesipus rolling his eyes, that, right, at the same time. It's probably not the first time he disturbed as he uh, heard it that way. He may even have used it himself. Right, as a play on words uh, for himself, but more than a pun, Paul was leveraging Onesimus' name to emphasize that he was not the same person who had run away. Remember uh, 1 Corinthians 5.17? If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. Philemon, this is not the old Onesimus who stole your stuff and ran off. This is a new Onesimus, useful to you, as he was to me. Verse 12, I'm sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. Now here, uh, we can see Paul raising that emotional temperature uh, just a bit, right? Uh, other people have been loyal to Paul, for sure, had cared for him. You know, churches took up offerings and sent to him where he was. Uh, but Onesimus had won a special place in his heart. And by calling Onesimus his very heart, He's putting the, this pressure on Philemon, this, this gentle pressure. If Philemon does not forgive and accept, he's literally trampling on Paul's heart. Ouch. By including that personal touch, right, he's making it clear that he's sending Onesimus back on grounds much greater than just a simple legal obligation of returning the slave uh, to his master. I would have liked to have kept him with me, verse 13, I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel. And note, note the difference in verb tense uh, between these two verses, 12 and 13. In verse 12, I am sending. Boom. I'm doing it. Here he is. Look in 13. I would have liked. Now, this is the imperfect tense. It implies there's a period of thinking, of debating in his mind, maybe even wavering, that he didn't come to the decision lightly, quickly, maybe even easily. It's like he was weighing the consequences of Onesimus' value to him while he was you know, in prison, Onesimus was helping him, versus the consequences of not only not having him by his side, but also the potential consequences for Onesimus if Philemon did not receive him back uh, in the manner that Paul was asking for. Now, he doesn't specify exactly how Onesimus was helping him uh, in Philemon's place, but the implication here is that Onesimus saw himself as acting on something of Philemon's behalf, since he was Philemon's slave. And Paul doesn't specify, uh, okay, next, next one here. P Paul and Onesimus, uh, they, possibly they had talked about this after Onesimus had you know, received Christ, gotten saved, those things. Uh, you know, I'm very glad for your help and companionship, Onesimus, but legally, you belong to Philemon. Yeah, uh, but since I do, um, let's just think of me acting on his behalf, you know, while I'm here in Rome. Uh, okay, but do you actually have permission? Do you have his blessing to be here and help me? Um, this takes to verse 14. I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. This is where Paul's thinking went from thought to action. It may take some time to make up his mind, but the path forward was clear, right? However much he would have liked Onesimus to stay, he needed Philemon's permission for all this to be right. For without Philemon's willing agreement, Onesimus staying with Paul was in effect Paul stealing from Philemon. It's like stealing Onesimus from him as Onesimus had in effect stolen from Philemon uh, by leaving. So that any favor you do would not seem forced. Here again, Paul's referencing his authority to order Philemon to accept uh, Onesimus's, Onesimus back. Before I'm done with this, I'll get, that, I'll get his name pronounced correctly. 
Look at verse 15 and 16. Perhaps the reason he was separated you from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother in the Lord. Of course, we know the Bible's overall thread of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, right? Here we see Paul tapping into that theme of redemption, leading to the desired outcome, his request for Onesimus' restoration. Now, so far, Paul hadn't said anything about why Onesimus ran off uh, in the first place, but here with that perhaps, Paul may be appealing a bit to the providence of God uh, in all of this. It's like he's saying, I know what Onesimus did was wrong. That's his fall. He's guilty. But because nobody can see all the inner workings of how God accomplishes his will, maybe God was using all of this to produce good. And that without his escape, he never would have come to faith in Christ and never would have become more useful to both you and me than as just a slave, a bond servant. You lost a slave, but you gained a brother in Christ. <clears throat> Notice also there another contrast here in verse 15 of time frame. Okay, in the front of the verse, they were separated for a little while, <clears throat> but Philemon might have him back forever. A little while, forever. The Greek here for a little while, it's the same word used in John 5, 35, where Jesus, talking about John the Baptist, said he was burning, he was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. And also in 2 Corinthians 7, uh, verse 8, if I made you grieve with my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it, for I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. In contrast, prospect for Philemon is that he will have Onesimus, useful Onesimus, permanently. The no longer a slave there in verse 16 could be a request for Philemon to grant Onesimus his freedom. That would seem to be the literal reading. You will have him back no longer as a slave. <clears throat> but Paul says have him back forever. Compare that with the Hebrew law for slaves recorded in both Exodus 21.6 and Deuteronomy 15.17. He shall be his slave forever. There's that word again, forever. So remember we talked last week about Paul's letter to the entire church at Colossae in Colossians 3.11, that here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. The distinctions of where someone's from, what they look like, what language they speak, race and ethnicity, all that, it's not eliminated, but that unifying principle of faith in Jesus transforms the relationships you know, between these people. So given what we said about Paul not advocating for an overthrow of the institution of slavery, more likely he's sending a plea for a transformed relationship between himself and Onesimus based on that shared faith in Christ. The social distinctions haven't gone away, but the shared relationship in Christ is the vastly more important factor. Which leads us into verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Here now is Paul's transactional request. All right, he's talked almost exclusively up to this point about relationship and love. But here's the deal Paul wants. And the requested transaction is based on the relationship between Paul and Philemon, between Philemon and Christ, between Paul and Christ, and between Onesimus and Christ. And now, between Philemon and Onesimus. Now remember, slaves were property. Exchanging slaves was a transaction. Property changing hands. By using the term partner, Paul was not shying away from this inescapably commercial dimension uh, in, in all of this. It's important to remember that Paul is not just reducing all this to a simple business deal. He's using that term partner also in the spiritual sense of their fair, the shared faith in Christ that keeps coming up. And in the sense uh, of their shared experience in ministry leadership. Right? Paul's reminding Philemon that he, like Paul, had worked for the sake of the gospel. Remember the church met in his home? That carried a certain degree of risk uh, in that culture. 
And notice Paul asked Philemon to welcome him into your house as you would welcome me. Remember, Paul had once held the highest social standing in his community, Pharisee, Hebrew of Hebrews. He understood what it was like to live in the corner office, in essence. And he knew how Philemon would look upon Onesimus. He was a slave, regardless of this newfound faith uh, in Christ. And so by asking Philemon to welcome him, as he would welcome Paul, Paul is in effect saying, he's no longer just a slave. He and I, we're equals. At the same time, this relationship between Philemon and Onesimus could not be restored fully without dealing with the financial aspect right, of the whole thing. Onesimus had run away. He had stolen some of the stuff on his way out the door, and he was gone for a long time. Remember last week we said, and I drew it on the map, that uh, it would take about a week to walk the 100 miles between Colossae and Ephesus, about 100 miles. Rome was 1,300 miles from Colossae. Three or four months walk to get there at best, and travel wasn't exactly safe and secure and all those things. So long time to get there. And Onesimus was in Rome for a while. We don't know how long, but long enough to meet with Paul, hear the gospel, respond to it, and for he and Paul to develop this close-knit relationship. And then for Tychicus and Onesimus to go back to Colossae, it could have been a year, maybe two, between the time that he split and now the door opens and he's standing there again in front of Philemon. So it has been quite a while. And very likely, when Philemon realized that Onesimus was gone, he probably bought another slave, right? So not only did Philemon steal himself, or Onesimus steal himself from Philemon, stole some stuff, he also stole from Philemon's pocketbook when he had to purchase a replacement. Which brings us to verse 18. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. Obviously, Onesimus had done Philemon some pretty serious wrongs. There wouldn't be a letter to Philemon if he hadn't. Aside from running away, the wrongs he committed are, are not explained. They're not, they're not laid out in detail. But notice Paul says, charge it to my account. He doesn't ask him to forgive, but he continues his use of this, com this commercial, this business language. Some commentators think that this reveals perhaps an uncertainty on Paul's part, that Philemon is going to do you know, what he's asking to do. And if that's the case, think about the guarantee that Paul is making here. He, I mean, he's under, he's under house arrest, right? No conceivable means of making tents or selling them, earning the income you know, to pay off the financial debt that Onesimus uh, you know, caused Philemon. I mean, he may have known wealthy backers that could have, you know, paid it off and stuff. But either way, he's putting himself and his reputation on the line. And he doubles down in verse 19. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. Now, here the handwriting in the letter changes. All right? I was bound to catch Philemon's attention. Now, despite the personal nature, Paul didn't write the whole letter himself. He was dictating it to a, a secretary. Amanuensis uh, is the, the kind of the technical term for that. That was normal at the time. Paul's other letters uh, were done that way. For example, Romans 16.22. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. So we see that's pretty common. But at this point in the letter, Paul picks up the pen or quill or stylus or, you know, whatever, and takes over at the climax of the appeal. It's like his declaration and his handwriting is his final, personal, legally binding guarantee to right the wrongs that Onesimus uh, has committed. And to seal the deal, uh, as it were, Paul reminds Philemon of not only their shared faith, shared partnership in the gospel, but that Philemon's faith itself must be traced back to Paul. And so here with that, Paul transitions away from the transactional and business language and softens things up by going back to the personal. Verse 20, I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. A brother, the term brother has a family component, right? 
So the shift from the business language, uh, pretty clear. I look at these final two things that Paul uh, is hoping for from Philemon. Benefit. Same root word for useful. Onesimus. No doubt Philemon would have noticed that, perhaps smiled at the, the play on words. And refresh my heart. Where have we heard that before? Verse 7, right? Echoes what Paul loved about Philemon, as he mentioned back at the, the front of the letter. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. So in effect, Paul's asking Philemon for the very thing he's best known for, right? So easy a caveman could do it, if you remember those ads. Paul's statement here is that he is confident in Philemon's obedience and that that confidence is not based on the strength of his appeal to him, though it is a strong one. His confidence is based on the personal relationship and the mutual respect. So with that, Paul's appeal is complete. But before concluding uh, his letter, he makes one more request, verse 21. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me, because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. That term, uh, and one thing more, you know, we heard Steve Jobs in all those Apple presentations, and one more thing, and then he would, you know, the iPhone or the iPad, whatever the big deal was. But the term here, that could also be translated at the same time. So rather than being something separate, it was tying a bow on the whole thing, really, not a separate piece, uh, by asking Philemon to treat both Onesimus and Paul in the same way. Welcome, them into, welcome him into your home, as you wrote in verse 17. And again, he and I were equals. So invite him into your home, prepare a room for me because I'm coming. It's the same thing. And then the final verses here, Paul's passing on the greetings of those who are with him. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, send you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. We've seen that word before, fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And that final verse, and we'll end with this, is that Paul's use of your, grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. That's plural. Remember he wrote the, the letter to not only Philemon, but also you know, the other folks in the house uh, in your church. So that your is, it's kind of like y'all, right? Grace of the Lord Jesus be with y'all's spirit. And while it was directed primarily to Philemon, Aphia the sister, Archippus, fellow soldier, church, the idea of this plural your is just the sense that the entire church that met there uh, in, in his house there at Colossae would have the same spirit, that they'd be of one accord if we will, we know that language, in their response to Paul's central request of Philemon, that plea to accept Onesimus, but also in the resulting forgiveness and acceptance of Onesimus as a brother in Christ. Let's pray. Well, Lord, thank you for this little letter to Philemon, and there's so much truth in such a short uh, narrative. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and your forgiveness and how your Holy Spirit gives us the strength and power to forgive others. So Lord, as we think of who the Onesimuses are in our life and who the, the Pauls and the Philemons and the other uh, just characters in, in the story here, Lord, uh, are in our lives, I pray that we would have the mind of Christ, and the spirit of Christ to forgive. In Christ's name, amen.